Climate change is a very unique global challenge, uh, right from increasing flooding and droughts to poor air quality. The effects are pretty complex, severe, and it's really happening in our day-to-day -day lives now. So we launched our climate change strategy in 2020, and CDC's Paris Align Statement is based on fundamentally three building blocks. First, we are investing in a net zero world by 2050. Second, we are supporting a just transition to a net zero economy by keeping the creation of jobs and skill development at the forefront of what we are doing. And third, we, strengthen, we are strengthening the adaptation and resilience of sectors, communities, businesses, and people. We, um, we got into the solar business because we were pr trying to provide the most efficient source of energy for off-grid consumers. Um, and thankfully, you know, there's a really amazing uh, side advantage to that uh, most efficient technology, which is that it's also the cleanest technology. So it's not only the most affordable way to provide energy for, you know, an off-grid home, uh, but a solar panel on the roof is also reducing carbon emissions that can be really significant from off-grid households. The kind of funding arrangement which CBC has given us, I think our wastewater management facilities will be able to provide industries the way forward in meeting their SDG 6 goals. And I think that it will be very beneficial for the industries uh, in the longer run. So our South Asia vision for climate is fairly comprehensive. We are addressing it across the, the climate theme and we are taking climate as a central theme across our sectors and making sure that we build sustainable business. Good afternoon to all joining us today and I'm very pleased to be here. My name is Holger Rotenbusch. Um, I'm the Managing Director responsible for Infrastructure and Climate um, at CDC. And I'm very pleased to uh, have the opportunity to moderate a panel on CDC's impact on the planet after having had a great panel on people, um, which um, uh, Tony just sort of finished. So, um, I mean, very clearly, uh, staying with the theme of this year's annual review, rising to the challenge, I think we can all agree that climate change is one of the biggest challenges that um, mankind faces at this point in time. And this is absolutely the case in all of our countries, which are very much impacted by the consequence of climate change, which many of these countries actually don't contribute. But then again, in a few countries that we do invest in, like India, for example, um, that is also the case that there is a very significant contribution to the problem of climate change. So we very much have engaged on this topic uh, a little while ago and last year we released our new climate change strategy across um, a number of um, uh, different categories like our ambition to net zero which is uh, targeting our um, CO2 emissions uh, across our portfolio, the um, era of just transition uh, which is focused on how do we ensure that we don't leave communities and individuals behind in the in the climate transition, uh, as well as on adaptation and resilience, which is particularly relevant for countries across Africa and South Asia, which, as I said, many countries are suffering from the consequences. And how do we support businesses, communities, and individuals to be more resilient to the fallout of climate change? 
So we'll hear more about that uh, as we progress. And already f years ago, we have started very significantly to pivot in this direction. So over the last four years, we invested over a billion dollars in climate finance, and we're picking up pace. I mean, just this year alone, we are looking to invest way in excess of a half a billion. Um, and in our new five-year strategy, we are actually looking to invest over $5 billion. So climate change, climate finance is uh, a very important theme for the organization um, in the next five years and is already. And I'm very pleased um, to be able to introduce some facets thereof today and some um, key people that are working with us here at CDC, but also some important partners in our market. So you will be hearing about the strategy and the policy work that we've been doing you will meet some entrepreneurs and some partners of CDC that we're working with, and you will hear how they are in their businesses making a contribution to climate change and how they collaborate with CDC. And you will be hearing from one of our senior investment professionals in one of our investment teams um, about the transactions that we've been looking at last year and also the challenges that we faced uh, during the pandemic. There is a Q&A, hopefully, that we have some time for, so please do send in questions via the chat. and. Um, um, I hope that we can get a chance to at least answer some of those. So with that, um, I would like to uh, introduce um, the, the first panelist, um, which is um, Amali, um, who is our director for um, climate change. Um, she um, joined us sort of uh, over sort of a year and a half back. Uh, and took a very lead role in the design of um, CDC's climate strategy. Before that, she was the chief climate officer at the Inter-American Development Bank, having spent um, a very significant amount of time before that uh, in the environmental development uh, and climate space in the UK. And at the moment, she's one of the senior advisors to the COP26 presidency team. Um, and obviously, we are very pleased to have her as part of our team, and um, she is working very closely with our investment um, uh, as we speak. So, Amali, and I'll introduce the other panelists as we go through. So, if I can just sort of uh, start with you, um, Amali. Um, as I mentioned, you played a very important role in in designing our climate strategy, uh, which we launched last year. So, can you just talk to us about you know the key elements of that, and also the experience and the progress that we have made over the last twelve months? Great, yes, thank you, Holger. So our climate strategy uh, sets out how we are aligning ourselves, our activities and our investments with the Paris Agreement. And we have three main building blocks to the strategy. So the first one is uh, to be net zero by 2050, net zero emissions. Uh, the second is how we can invest to support uh, a, social, a socially just transition for workers and communities. And thirdly, how we can ensure all our investments are resilient to climate impacts, as well as invest more in the businesses that can bring the technologies and other services that are going to be needed to enable our countries, our geographies, to be able to adapt to a changing climate. So briefly, um, in terms of progress, it's been an extremely busy year, uh, as it has been for the rest of uh, others in CDC. Um, we, uh, in terms of the net zero commitment, well, we've made um, a lot of new investments in some very innovative businesses uh, that will be needed to enable the net zero transition. Uh, one of which is Greenlight Planet, which um, uh, Anish will be talking about uh, later. Uh, and so um, that's obviously uh, been a key part of our agenda over the last year. But we're also looking ahead uh, to uh, understand what our pathway to net zero looks like, which is very important that we're, uh, we've made this long term commitment by, by 2050. But we also want to ensure that for our next five year strategy period in particular, that we are on the right pathway. So we've been looking at our carbon footprint now and, and identifying what that uh, pathway will look like in the next five year period. Uh, we've also uh, have a new fossil fuel policy, which is fully aligned with the UK government's fossil fuel policy, where um, we are excluding all fossil fuels, uh, with an exception for investments in gas power, where there is no real alternative um, and a real development need. And we've developed and launched uh, CDC's gas guidance tool, uh, which enables us to assess the potential to which a gas power investment is aligned with the Paris Agreement, in which case we could invest in it, or if it's misaligned, in which case we would not. 
Uh, we've been working with uh, key partners in South Africa and India around a uh, developing, designing a finance roadmap for a just transition. And in fact, just next week, we'll be launching our new um, uh, report uh, marking the progress towards a finance roadmap in India. Um, so an event that uh, Trini will be hosting on our behalf next week um, to launch that report. And then, as I mentioned, the, the critical challenge for investing more in adaptation and resilience. So uh, we have started to make some uh, investments in, the, in those uh, businesses uh, that are going to be needed, some very innovative businesses. You'll hear from Prorec uh, about um, Roserve, which is a particularly um, great example of the type of business we will need to ensure um, that uh, those in our markets are able to be uh, to manage the climate risks associated with you know, increased drought and water scarcity over time. And um, but we know it's also very challenging to do this alone. So uh, last November, we, we launched a new initiative, a collaborative with other DFI part and partners uh, to uh, build stronger collaboration in a, that can enable us to bring uh, relevant uh, expertise, relevant finance, um, different risk appetite uh, to uh, really accelerate investment in these businesses that are going to be needed to uh, deliver on adaptation and resilience. So uh, I think all in all, a very busy year. Um, and uh, just to mention as well, um, in, in the annual uh, accounts this year, we have uh, provided our second uh, Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure, uh, TCFD. So um, that marks uh, very significant progress in how we are addressing climate risk uh, within our own uh, internal uh, processes, governance strategy uh, and risk management. So uh, yeah, a very busy year. Great. Um, well, thanks very much, Amalie. Indeed, um, you know, a lot of progress uh, across a broad range of areas. And uh, well, you mentioned Prarik, and maybe that's the cue for me to um, bring him into the conversation. And I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Prarik Guell, who is the co-founder of a company called Roserf Enviro out of India, um, which is focused on water, wastewater treatment um, with a very innovative and um, cutting edge technology. Uh, Prarig is the co-founder of the company and he has very extensive sort of experience over 18 years in, in water, wastewater and recycling in the industry, which is extraordinary when you think about this, where, where the industry is in India. So I'm very pleased, well, first of all, that he is a partner of CDC and that we are working together, but also very pleased and welcome Prarig that he's joining us today here on the panel. And uh, Prarig, if I can, um, it would be great if you were to tell us a bit about, well, what does Rosurf do? and what are the services, what are the needs that um, you, know, you are meeting um, with your business? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you very much, Holger. And uh, it's a pleasure to be part of the, uh, part of the entire uh, communication drive that you've launched. And yeah, it's, it's just a bit about the background about the company. Um, so, so Rosev has been developed mainly with the aim of helping companies achieve uh, sustainable manufacturing. Um, you know, we wanted we wanted to help companies deal with wastewater management because uh, the way we saw wastewater was actually a source of, of water. So the idea was to help these companies instead of relying on freshwater resources or groundwater resources, which a large chunk of companies did in, in countries like India. Um, it was to shift them away from utilizing groundwaters to, to, you know, to make actually wastewater recycling more adaptive for them. Um, what we have done is we've kind of come up with uh, solutions which are not just technologically advanced in, in wastewater recycling, but also energy efficient. Um, and the whole premise is that we, we come in and invest with companies, provide solutions as a service uh, where the company is able to focus on their core businesses and technologies. And we come in and supplement and, and help them manage both the investment and the operations of their wastewater management plants. Um, so it's, it's about delivering, recycling, and attaining zero liquid discharge, depending on, on what the objectives are. And uh, you know, looking at what is the energy intensive requirement, because a lot of, uh, <clears throat> a lot of recycling and, uh, uh, and ZLD solutions really get lost when, the, when it comes to the energy efficiency, because, you know, so far, most solutions, conventional technologies use a lot of energy and there's a lot of emission related issues with, with the amount of energy that they're utilizing. 
So, so the focus at our end really has been uh, to come up with a combination of, of advanced technology as well as uh, energy efficiency to, to deliver a, a both an efficient, a sustainable, and a long-term viable option in terms of both capital investments and operating costs. Yeah, thanks, Parikh. Um, um, and I think it is uh, it's important to highlight. I mean, uh, uh, Rosa is one of the one of the leading companies in that space in India. So what Parikh was describing is really cutting edge um, uh, in India. And as you can imagine, the topic of water and wastewater is absolutely critical uh, to to um, respond to some of the key challenges around climate change. And that's then maybe just to lead on this, Parikh, if you would, when you reflect on what your company does and the different elements thereof, including the energy efficiency and such things. I mean, how do you sort of look at this as a contribution of your company to, um, to the challenge of climate change? Well, I think the, the issues that we address very directly are water pollution and, uh, you know, we create an alternate source of water. Um, now, as I said before, you know, for a factory to run, it needs a daily you know, input fresh water as well as it needs to discharge a certain amount of recycle or wastewater that that it's not able to reuse. Um, what we try and do is we try and use that as a source of bringing the water back to the to the company to the factory. So effectively, um, for textile industry, for example, ninety six percent of the wastewater which is being thrown out today can actually go back into the process and and they can reuse it. Now, the obvious benefit of this is that you are obviously reducing the amount of fresh water required. Uh, also, you're reducing the amount of pollution that was earlier going to a surface or a, or a you know, groundwater resource or even to a sewage treatment plant that was being set up and, and operated. Not designed to handle industrial wastewater, but over the years, they have tended to uh, accept industrial wastewater because the fees that they get. Uh, now, by, by recycling this, this, this wastewater, you, you know, the two main advantages, you're reducing the water pollution, um, you're making water available to the local community, which, which the industry was, was doing earlier. And, and India is a very typical example where we have accessed groundwater as freshwater resources. And we have, at the same time, thrown out untreated wastewater back to the ground, which is, in fact, polluted our groundwater resources. So, so making less available for everyone. So I think that's the key attribute that, that we as an organization um, have focused on, on addressing. Um, and it, it's about looking at you know both conventional wastewater um, because the again the energy impact on a conventional wastewater so so what people have typically done is they've they've taken wastewater treated it spent a lot of energy in treating it and then sent it to a, a source where they can't reuse it again so they've either discharged it to a surface water which is ultimately gone to the sea or they have sent it to the ground what we are doing is we're actually using that energy that they were deploying for treatment to actually recycle the wastewater so that's how we make our solutions more energy efficient um, in terms of delivering more value to the clients at, at the end of the day. Um, the, main, the main bottlenecks in adoption have been the cost of fresh water. So, you know, any, any client who looks at a solution always weighs the impact of, uh, of recycled water vis-a-vis -vis fresh water. And, and that's where, you know, a, a solution like Rosov, which is on a solution as you go basis, can really deliver value uh, to, to potential industry looking to adopt this, and, and especially in the developing world. Uh, what, what we like to structure is long-term contracts where the cost of recycled water is actually very close to the input cost of water today, um, and that kind of makes it a very viable um, you know, investment for them, and, and it's a long-term solution for the entire uh, environment and, and climate change impact. Um, well, thanks, um, Parag, and um, yeah, I mean, clearly, you know, what you mentioned highlights a problem that um, I suppose we're seeing in many countries that uh, prices are just not set at the right level. So with fresh water being too cheap, um, obviously businesses like Rosa have, um, you know, have to find other ways to make the offer attractive, but I'm afraid this is going to change. Maybe a final question if I can. Um, obviously we've talked about challenges uh, throughout the day already and um, um, last year was a year of challenge. And I was wondering if you were wanting to share uh, with us here today how you managed during the pandemic, what challenges you faced, and maybe also you know, how we collaborated with you, uh, what support you might have received from, from CDC. Yeah, sure. I think, uh, yeah, last year was, was something which took everybody by surprise. We were among them. 
um, I think the basic um, thing that we saw was that, uh, you know, it, it kind of challenged our, our basic premise. When we put in a solution in our factory, we assumed that the factory was going to run 24 seven because demand is going to be constant. People are going to be working consistently. Um, so last year changed that, you know, lockdowns came and got implemented. Um, factories got shut down. Uh, volumes reduced, you know, there were certain sectors like textiles, which were dramatically impacted. At the same time, there were sectors like pharmaceuticals, which, you know, which ran over time in terms of meeting the demands. And so, so we were, we were sort of lucky in, in that respect. We had a good number of clients, which, which were impacted at the same time, a good number of clients, which saw positive impacts. Um, so obviously, you know, we, we struck a balance somewhere, uh, even though the growth was, was slow, I think, um, Overall, you know, we, we came up um, not not too bad. I think we we did pretty well for the for the year. Uh, but but yeah, definitely it, it shows us that we need to be diverse both in terms of our, our, our applications, the industries we service, as well as the markets uh, that we're active in. So that's I think that's a definitely something which we have learned from from last year, and and we look forward to implement that. Um, in terms of the support and relationship with CDC, I think it was it's been remarkable. I mean, CDC was very quick. Uh, in their response uh, to our requirements, you know, we, we saw obviously demand falling off in certain places and new demands being created in other geographies. Uh, and, and I think, you know, the collaboration. Um, well, welcome back and apologies um, for this mishap. Um, I was actually just uh, sort of highlighting how important technology will be in the combat against climate change. And here we go. I think technology is important uh, in all walks of life. I mean, certainly in this still largely remote world. Um, but thanks, Parekh, um, for, your, uh, for your contribution. And um, in the interest of time, I would like to move on. And I would like to introduce um, the second entrepreneur that has kindly made himself available to join us today. Um, uh, moving from India to Africa, um, I'm very pleased to introduce Anish Tucker to you. He is the co-founder of a company called Greenlight Planet, which he co-founded and he ran as the CEO until 2016. Now he's responsible for fundraising and new products, but he is one of the pioneers of the off-grid solar space. And last year, CDC provided funding to his business. So it's a great honor and pleasure to welcome Ashish. And um, I would similarly like to ask you to tell us about Greenlight Planet. It's mind boggling in terms of the numbers of customers that you reach, but do tell us about the business. Ah, okay, sorry. I understand that um, that might have been an audio issue. Ashish, I was welcoming you and um, I was um, inviting you to tell us a bit about Greenlight Planet. <laughs> The company that you co-founded. So please, over to you. Excuse me, I'm back. Um, my name is Anish and I, I co-founded Greenlight uh, Planet. So over 720 million people live off of the electric grid. And Greenlight makes low cost, high quality and affordable uh, decentralized solar energy systems to provide electricity to, to these households. We, we began 12 years ago uh, focused on developing the product. And what we realized along the way was this was uh, took a lot more than than just having the right technology. It required very high touch um, engagement with customers, at home installation and service, and most critically, purchase financing. Off grid homes on average spend forty cents per day to uh, fuel small kerosene lamps for light um, and to pay for mobile phone charging. Um, that's like $120 every year, but purchasing a $120 solar home system that could light up the whole house and power small appliances to pay for that upfront is, is impossible for most off-grid households. So that purchase financing is very essential. So five years ago, we began our direct-to-consumer solar financing business. And in this, we, uh, we have 6,000 company-managed field agents who uh, with and 200 branches in Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Nigeria, and Zambia. And these agents go into the rural off-grid areas in these countries and uh, speak to off-grid houses, demonstrate the product, help them apply for purchase financing, and then install the systems in the home and provide at-home service and, uh, and service those customers through their 
payment journey as they pay off their system. So customers, rather than spending $120 up front, which is impossible for most off-grid homes, they can spend 40 cents per day and pay off their system in about 10 months. Um, we've connected 2.5 million off-grid households in the last five years, and we add 100,000 new off-grid houses every single month. Um, and we uh, install uh, 500,000 watts of decentralized rooftop solar every month. Great, um, Ashish, thank you very much indeed. As I mentioned, I mean, these are very significant numbers and uh, the run rate of the business is phenomenal. And all these companies like Greenlight Planet and fortunately very few, quite a few of those are supported by CDC as well are making a massive contribution to uh, providing access um, in particular sort of in, 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 in less accessible areas uh, in, in countries where CDC operates. Um, so I think it would be also great if you were to expand a bit on last year, um, which um, as Prorik sort of highlighted, uh, there were a lot of curveballs being thrown his way and I'm sure that was the same for you and, uh, and your business. So it um, would be great to hear about, you know, what are the challenges that you, that you tackled? Was your business affected? And uh, also maybe just to reflect on the collaboration that, um, that we had uh, during last year. Well, I, I was starting by saying we're incredibly grateful for the support that CDC has shown. So we, we closed our, um, our debt facility with CDC in April of 2020. And I don't know if anyone remembers what was happening in April, March and April of 2020, but the whole world was shutting down and uh, no one was certain what the extent of the, of the coronavirus would be in, in our lives. Um, in global supply chains, in, in our own business, in the, uh, the consumer credit markets that we operate in. And it was a time when, you know, I, th I think um, a, a purely commercial lender could, could sort of back off of closing a large debt transaction. But, but CDC, in a very mission-driven way, um, provided an incredible amount of flexibility. Closing a multi-jurisdiction uh, secure debt transaction is remarkably complex, and doing that uh, layered on with the complexities of, of the state of the world in, in March of, of last year, um, we couldn't have done it without um, without the flexibility and support of CDC. So we're for, first just eternally grateful for that. Uh, of course, the last you know year and a half has been uh, incredibly trying for for everybody, um, and certainly everyone in Greenlight has seen um, loss and um, a personal loss and and uh, and, and really difficult um, difficult circumstances. Uh, but the, uh, our business has fared really well. So from a credit perspective, we've actually seen our repayment performance improve through the, the last year and a half of, uh, of, of the COVID period. Um, and I think that's proven that this asset class, which is quite new in, in terms of you know, bankable asset classes, uh, it's proven the resilience of this asset class, that uh, these off-grid households, you know, if, they're not paying for, to pay, if they're not paying off their solar energy device, they have to go back to, to spending uh, to, on kerosene to fuel these dim, smoky, and dangerous kerosene lamps. So despite um, you know, what, what's happened in many other global markets, you know, I think this asset class uh, that is um, consumer pay-go receivables, solar receivables, have shown remarkable resiliency. And that's been, I think, a, a, you know, a, great, um, a great benefit for us. Our business has grown remarkably as well. Um, we've, we've gone from the beginning of the COVID period, installing 50,000 uh, connecting 50,000 households per month to now we install 100,000 households per month. We've gone from 130 branches to, to opening up 70 new branches. We have 200 branches now. We've added new, uh, a new country, which is Zambia. So the business has grown remarkably well through the COVID period. Um, and uh, and really all of that through the support that, that CDC has provided in, in bringing in the, the, the debt that's allowed us to, uh, to expand the business. Great, Anish, thank you so much um, for elaborating on this. It is indeed remarkable how the company has fared during this time. And uh, we were all a bit surprised that the industry was not heavier hit. Now, having said that, um, we've just um, hopefully reached the final stages of putting together an emergency liquidity facility um, for the industry, for the energy access industry, um, to support liquidity, not for companies big as Greenlight Planet, but more mid-sized and smaller players, which are now feeling the pinch. And um, we are really seeing that there is need for support, which is evolving as we speak. So, but uh, still, it's great to listen to your story and I'm very pleased about the collaboration that we've been able to enter into last year. And um, I would like to now introduce our final panelist, um, Chris Chichiotomi. 
um, who is director for Infra Equity, responsible for our investments in Africa and Pakistan, who joined us from um, um, an infrastructure fund that he co-founded, which is a collaboration of ARM and Harris, focused on West Africa. He has over 20 years of experience uh, investing in infrastructure across power, transport, water, and um, was working on a number of um, very interesting transactions during last year, which um, I would really like to invite you, Chris, to um, talk to us about, maybe in the context of the very special situation that we faced in our markets. So how has this impacted our investment activities? Um, but then, you know, what transactions, what, uh, what investments have you looked at in your part of the organization um, where we do see very significant impacts regarding climate change? Thank you, Holger, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'll probably start off by saying we did see, um, like my fellow panelists have mentioned, a real slowdown in our planned um, investment activities in the infrastructure space, um, all largely driven by the pandemic. But one key um, sector I'd probably like to focus on is in transmission and distribution. Um, transmission and distribution being a key part of SDG 7 in terms of providing safe, reliable energy to our markets. So our investment activity in this space uh, is largely driven through our investee company, a company formed, founded by CDC called Gridworks. Gridworks sole purpose is to invest in Africa's electricity and distribution network. Now, a key part of this is engagement with government. And what we saw was a total slowdown, especially at the onset of the pandemic in the business and project development activities of this business. What we saw was basically government rightly prioritizing healthcare and getting the right things in place to try and manage the impact of the pandemic in their respective countries. So because of that, the team basically had to refocus their attention. They had to basically adapt to working remotely and also had to adapt in terms of how we ultimately engage with potential co-investors and industrial partners in this space. So one of the key things I guess the team focused on was very much looking at relying on CDC's in-country presence, particularly where we had positive engagements with government. The team also focused very much on utilizing our shareholders in-country presence also, where we could use that to accelerate and engage government at the right time. And what we saw at the back end of 2020 was the, based on the efforts of the team, based on the continual engagement with government and our partners, all largely done virtually, aside from where we were able to use the support of CDC and also our, our, our shareholder FCDO, the team successfully put forward a proposal to the government of DRC on the DFI sponsored project uh, called the ESSO project. And at the back end of 2020, the team was successfully announced as the winner to, for them to implement a 22-year concession to basically build out three greenfield distribution grids in northern DRC. So this is three cities in DRC, serving a population equivalent of about 500,000 people. So this business will essentially be looking to build distributed renewable energy for the population that currently are fully underserved and have limited access to clean um, and safe electricity. So I would say that was probably, uh, in terms of the team working through a challenge of the pandemic, a positive outcome in terms of the efforts and the adaptability of that business to try and look to how we could work around this. So the team are now busy and I see 20 21 and the coming five-year period as a, as a big period for this business to try and implement this particular project. Now, if I talk about DRC, this actual investment will also complement CDC's current exposure in DRC in terms of the energy space. In 2016, CDC provided capital to a company called Virunga Power, which operates in Eastern DRC. And when we invested in, uh, when we provided this capital, Eastern DRC had probably about 3% of this population there that had any access to electricity. Today, that business is performing well. It is now providing significant power, all driven from renewable energy, which is hydro, to a large proportion of the population. People are able to now work longer hours. 
businesses, small and medium sized enterprises are able to operate there. And we're now seeing more industrialization taking place in a very difficult parts of Africa. So I would say that's one highlight for me in terms of the work that a company, our company Gridworks, which we co-founded in 2019, basically has been able to achieve in this space. So that's probably a key key one for me in terms of investment activities for us, Olga. Yeah, thanks, um, Chris, for this. And uh, the DRC is one of the countries that we are very much focused on from both perspectives, one from a climate change, but also from an access to energy perspective. Some of you will know that uh, a very significant proportion, up to 40% of the energy poor um, uh, living on the globe today are actually coming from DRC, Nigeria and Ethiopia. So. Um, we are very much focused on those countries, and as Chris mentioned, we have a number of approaches in particular in the DRC um, that we are currently looking to expand and uh, collaborate with other partners like the Rockefeller IKEA Foundation initiative that has recently been announced. And that's where uh, poverty alleviation and climate change or combat against climate change um, comes together uh, in a very sort of positive fashion. Um, I would like to maybe just on a few questions, and there were a few questions coming in through the chat, um, and maybe starting off with one for Amali. There was a question referring to um, how we engaged with our partner countries, in particular in the case of India and South Africa, which is what you referred to earlier, where we are looking at a framework uh, with regards to um, uh, just transition in particular. So how, how does the engagement work uh, with, uh, in these particular cases? Yes, so uh, we've been engaging um, uh, with both South Africa and India sort of in parallel, but actually bringing together stakeholders from both countries. So the issue of a just transition is actually very uh, advanced and, and mature um conversation i would say in south africa in particular uh perhaps not surprisingly given the reliance on on the coal sector uh not just for domestic but also for exports and uh so uh the just transition is also referenced within south africa's nationally determined contribution to the paris agreement so you know very much advanced there uh, and we saw there that the policymakers, governments, in fact, the president himself have been talking very much about the need for a just transition uh, in South Africa. And uh, so we've been working with um, a key partner there, um, the um, uh, TPI, who, who basically have um, uh, been working with other stakeholders uh, looking at the industrial uh, transition, the dimension of industrial transition for uh, South Africa, and uh, partnered with the uh, NBI, the National Business Initiative as well, uh, to look at what this means for the financial sector. And so engaging with different um, uh, local banks, uh, local um, uh, financial uh, players which are starting to identify what types of investments can be made now to assist that just transition in in South Africa. In India, it's um, it's a newer agenda, I would say, but rising in importance um, very much so. And uh, we've also been engaging with other key uh, players in South Africa who are looking at how a just transition and what that means for a more sustainable finance uh, approach in India. So they're looking to develop a taxonomy on sustainable finance. There's a UK-India working group looking to develop a, a sustainable finance roadmap. So we've been very much engaging there uh, to bring the just transition agenda into that and others that are involved. Um, so the Climate Bonds Initiative in India and uh, also the, the Reserve Bank of India now starting to look more and more at these issues along with issues around the task force on climate related financial disclosure. Great. Thanks, uh, Mamali. Um, and rushing to get a couple of more questions in one that I would want to put to Chris which is sort of building on what Amali had earlier referred to regarding our sort of energy transition, uh, i.e. that we are very much pivoting towards renewable energy, but that very selectively we continue to support gas projects. And maybe, um, you know, as you are uh, on the board of Globalec, um, it might be useful if you were to just briefly expand on the example of the Timana project in Mozambique that, was, that recently uh, reached financial close. 
Thank you, Holger. Um, I guess, yeah, may, I'll talk about Tamandi, but also let me just talk about, I guess, overall Globalec, what Globalec has been doing in, in, in our market. So Globalec, particularly during the pandemic, one thing I have to commend the company on uh, in terms of the impact on the pandemic was that throughout the pandemic, Globalec was able to operate all its assets to ensure the provision of 24-7 power to most of our countries. And we found that most of the countries, particularly during the heightened period of the pandemic, wanted us to ensure that we were able to provide them with power because they saw this as a critical enabler to basically manage healthcare, but also manage the impact of the pandemic in their respective countries. So if I pick on Globalec, so Globalec, to Amelie's point around the energy transition, has been very much focused on renewable, delivering renewable energy projects in the continent. It's currently delivering and about to commission a project in Kenya, which will be one of the largest solar plants there, 50 megawatts. And then to, to Mozambique. So Mozambique is a country of focus for us. The Mozambican government have been working very much with Globalec and its partners on its plan to transition from utilizing its current gas reserves to enable electrification of the country as part of its transition pathway. So the Tamani project is seen as a critical uh, investment, which scaled and, and we tested with our Paris aligned gas tool to ensure that the project was a qualifying project in terms of the pathway to net zero for the particular country. And as you've indicated earlier, Holger, that project is in the process of reaching financial close in the next couple of weeks. Alongside that project, Globalec has also been developing a first of its kind solar plus battery which was partly supported by CDC's um, CDC Plus facility. And again, this is all part of the country's ambition to essentially adapt more, adopt more renewables onto their energy mix. And Globalec ultimately is playing a, a key role for the country in doing this. So initially through Tamane to try and get base load into the grid. And then over time, the ability with the likes of the Kowamba project, which is the 19 megawatts and battery storage project, which will enable more renewable to come onto the grid in Mozambique and ultimately help it get to a, a position in terms of its just transition. Um, and that's something uh, Globalec is very much front and center at. Thanks, Chris. Um, and thanks, Lord Collins, for that question. I mean, it is something that we are grappling with um, very intensely, and I hope this was helpful. And uh, if you have further questions, you're very happy to engage on this separately. The last question that I, I would like to put to our um, two partners, um, and would like to start with, with Prorec. Um, and the question is, how, from the company's perspective or the management's perspective, um, should a DFI like CDC focus its investment, its engagement, and how can we be helpful to help the company to raise funding from mainstream investors? Uh, I, it's, I, I guess it's all about awareness. Um, what, what we're seeing actually is that, um, you know, climate change is real, it's there. Um, you know, we all need to act, con you know, in a consolidated combined manner. Um, but it is the how that, you know, we really need to solve for. So, uh, you know, what I think the way that we, we see it is that, uh, instead of looking at it as a step in an uncharted territory, we actually, you know, make it more, um, uh, you know, make the investor community more adaptive to, to investing in these sort of projects, uh, especially in developed economies, because I think currently it is seen that it's, it's highly risky. The investments are very heavy. And I think that's, that, that change is, is, is what needs to be brought about. I think that, that awareness that it can be done, it has been done. And, and let's get it done together is, is something that, that we really feel would be the way forward. Um, showcasing the benefits, um, you know, of the best as, as the best incentives, uh, you know, wastewater reuse, for example, um, is something that we can really deliver from day one. So, you know, the energy, energy savings, there's a lot of impact that can be created uh, by looking at this. So that's, that's probably, uh, you know, what needs to be done from, from our perspective. Thanks for that. And Anish, um, 30 seconds. What would you add from your perspective on this? To, to echo Parikh's point about uh, awareness, that's very key. And, and just to, to go one step further on the how, 
Um, we, we, we see a, a DFI like CDC's, the, the biggest role they can play in, in these uh, climate um, very climate relevant businesses like Greenlight is these are new businesses, they're new technologies, the business models are new. Um, the, the, and, and, and so, you know, as, as we installed systems in the first 10,000 households, you know, that, that was high risk. We didn't know what the repayment performance would be, the unique economics, the profitability, that's funded with high risk capital, um, equity financing that expects high returns. But then when, when we have 10,000 systems paid off, you know, that's something that we look to, to the local banks and say, you know, we wanna finance the next 10 million households um, with bank financing. But, but these banks look at this and say, this stuff's new. We don't know it, we don't understand it yet. And we think there's just a critical period between when, that, that proof point when it's a proven business model um, and and when the the likes of um, of the large banks in the in the world and in these regions uh, feel comfortable um, funding these asset classes, that that's the role that that DFIs like CDC can play, and that's that's really what we think you know businesses like Greenlight and others that are are leading the way in in climate transition need. They, they need that financing um, in that gap between viability and when this becomes the boring bankable um, asset class that we all expect it, it will be one day. Great, thanks, Anish. And I'm afraid our time is up. Apologies again for the technology glitch earlier, but um, I hope you found it interesting to listen to how we are thinking about our contribution to climate change, that you had a chance to meet some of our partners. You heard about our strategy, which is evolving, and um, you know what investments we are looking at. So I think it's definitely one of the core themes for CDC, which I'm very proud to be leading. Um, and um, you know, I'm very pleased that I was joined today by a fantastic panel, which I would like to thank at this stage. And um, now I'm giving back to Lindsay for the rest of the program. Thank you so much. Thank you, Holger, and to Tony and to all of our panelists for contributing in those last two um, incredible sessions. So, um, I also want to say thank you to all of you for staying with us through to the end, um, for your questions and engagement, and for bearing with us um, occasionally through technical glitches. As you can see, I've been rejoined by Graham and Nick um, for some final reflections. So um, if I can come to you, Nick, first mm. for your final reflections mm. on the day. Well, thank you, Lindsay, and thanks for everybody who participated in this, indeed all of you for, for listening. Um, I, I thought I'd spend just a couple of minutes talking about the future uh, for CDC. And I think you'll probably have gathered that we've done, uh, just by listening to the last three hours or so, that we have built a very solid foundation here at CDC. And I think our ambition is to be recognized really as a leader among development finance institutions and a leader indeed among impact investing institutions focused on, particularly those focused on emerging markets. And that really means we've got to deliver on both our parts of our dual mandate. We've got to make investments that are sustainable because that's important in creating long-term impact. Uh, and we've also got to make, uh, we've got to um, make investments that demonstrably make a difference uh, to people's lives. And so as I think forward into the next strategy period, I think that's going to mean you're going to see CDC continue to be really laser focused on our impact creation, uh, being, being, I think, clearer on our overall impact objectives. You're going to hear us talking about three broad impact themes around productivity, around sustainability and around inclusion. Productivity meaning the degree to which we can help support growth and the, the, the way that we can help catalyze markets. Sustainability meaning ensuring that we invest along in, in line with our climate targets. And inclusive meaning we're reaching the poorest people, the poorest countries and the most, uh, and the most excluded groups. I think also as you look into the next strategy period, you'll see us still continuing to operate and to invest in, in, in scale. I think you, could ex you should expect us to be probably uh, one of the very largest, certainly of the bilateral DFIs. I think a difference will be that a lot more of what we'll, we do next strategy period will be driven by recycled capital. So I'd expect, I wouldn't be surprised to see 90% uh, of our investments funded through our own recycled capital. I think you should expect to see us continuing to have uh, a high risk appetite. And I think that's very important for development finance institutions. So it means we invest across the capital structure. It means uh, we continue to develop innovative, innovative forms of finance, continue to develop uh, blended finance, more perhaps uh, investment in local currency. I think we'll continue to be a leader in equity. That's the riskiest part of the capital structure and frankly the most uh, uh, in demand. 
um, I think will continue, as I said earlier, to, to lead in, in, uh, in fragile states. Um, I think you will see us continue to try to be uh, innovative and try to support new technologies. You know, we've talked a lot today about the role of technology, and there's no doubt, particularly even before COVID, but especially post-COVID and post the pandemic, um, technology gives us the opportunity to really make transformational change in terms of development impact in the countries that we uh, are investing in. And so we really need to be at the forefront in terms of uh, supporting both infrastructure as well as, uh, as, well as entrepreneurs. Uh, uh, we will uh, be doing an increasing amount, obviously, in climate. We've talked a lot about that in the, in the, in the previous, se uh, previous uh, session, specific targets around how much of our investment is focused on climate finance. Uh, and continuing, uh, I expect, to play this uh, a leadership role, which I think we're already playing in, uh, in gender lens finance. Um, and then finally, I guess I'd say we'll, you would ex also expect us, and because I think this is important, uh, to be a national standard bearer for the UK. Uh, we are funded by the UK taxpayer. Uh, I think over the last few years, we've built much stronger links uh, with our shareholder, the FCDO. We've got more people on the ground, and I think that really helps us in terms of strengthening those links. And I think we should be, CDC should be, development finance should be really a core part of the overall UK offer and the overall force for good uh, in, uh, in, uh, in developing uh, countries. So I guess I just conclude by saying I think we've come, and I think that you will have heard, we've come a, uh, come a long way. I think we still have a long way to travel. Uh, we now have nine years to, uh, to, the, uh, uh, to, the, uh, uh, to 2030 and, the, uh, and the, uh, uh, hope, hopefully the completion of the SDGs. Uh, we've got obviously a post-pandemic economic environment which will require a lot of uh, support. We still live in a world with enormous inequality. We still live in a world where climate change is a significant threat uh, to all of us and particularly in those, in, in those markets. But I hope that you, um, having listened to everybody, I hope you, um, you recognize that we have an in, uh, enormously talented, capable, hardworking, passionate group of people uh, working, uh, working on this. And you heard, had the opportunity to hear from many of them today, as well as many of the investees that we've been able to back, who I think are creating real, uh, real change. Uh, so um, I, I'll close by saying, look, we have many challenges in the next, uh, in the next strategy period. But one of our challenges, frankly, is to replace our chairman. And Graham has done a truly, as Lindsay said in her introduction, a truly remarkable job over the last eight years in, uh, in building uh, CDC into the organization it is today. Uh, so I'm going to leave the last word uh, to Graham. Mm. Oh, well, <coughs> thank you. Thank you, Nick, for those kind words. So uh, <coughs> a couple of words on my succession. Uh, those of you with long mem memories, will know that I was appointed in the summer of 2013. And the standard timeline for the chair of CDEC is two terms of three years. So I'm definitely well past my sell-by sell date now. Uh, I was asked to stay on due to COVID, which of course I gladly did. Uh, but the foreign secretary and the board are now very comfortable for us to go ahead with a well-planned and thought out succession plan. Um, an official public appointments process will start in the next few weeks and an appointment and a smooth transition will take place in Q4. So this works out really well in terms of timing because the new strategy period, which Nick has just given us a flavor of all the exciting times ahead, uh, will become operational from January 2022. And in the meantime, I promise all of you, I will carry on working to the very best of my ability until the transition is complete. So um, now it's just, a, a, so I forget all about succession and just carry on. So now it is just uh, for me to say thank you on behalf of all the board and Nick. Thank you to Lindsay uh, and her team for all of today and all the work you do the year communicating CDC's uh, efforts. Um, thank you to our partners, portfolio partners on the ground in Africa and Asia, all the staff, the management teams, the entrepreneurs and our fellow DFI partners around the world we work with, as you've heard many times today. Uh, thank you to our shareholder, from the Foreign Secretary um, uh, to and, and ministers to officials in post and in regions and Moza Malik and Rachel Turner and their teams in London. Um, and thank you to all you stakeholders uh, for your support and challenge. As I said before, scrutiny can be and often is uncomfortable, but it does make us better. 
thank you to my fellow board members, especially uh, Ke Keki and Wim, who stood down after six years of, of great service. And of course, so much heartfelt thanks to the team at CDC. You probably saw 15 of them today, and there's another uh, 480 j just, just like them. And you, the, for the dedication, the passion, and the ingenuity you've shown through these COVID years. As you'll have seen from these presentations, we have an outstanding management team uh, at CDC, and thank you all. Uh, and Nick, uh, uh, you've led uh, through this crisis, not only with calmness, and calmness is a great quality to have at a time of crisis, but with uh, clear strategic uh, clarity and speed. And no one has worked harder than you. Zoom calls, team calls, Zoom to dust, weekends, uh, weekdays, just amazing. So thank you so much. You. Um, uh, and thank you finally to all of you for listening. We hope to see you next year in person. Please keep us, give us suggestions how we can do it better other than the IT, which we really <laughs> will do. But just keep, we always want to keep on better, get, get, get improving. So thanks so much. And I think that's a wrap.